if you have recessions in emerging markets, they tend to look different, right? When we think of recessions in the developed world, we think of a disinflationary credit crunch, right? We think of a big spike in unemployment. We think of of um, asset prices going down nominally. We think of all those type of things. Uh, but when you look at recessions in the emerging world, often in their local currency, <laughs> stocks go up. Uh, unemployment might not spike, but everybody's poorer because their their income buys them less energy or buys them less import, imports, for example. They feel squeezed even though they might still be employed, and they might be earning more local currency units than they did last year and the year before. Um, I, I think basically the U.S. is going through a period that's going to be – it's like a developed – market but with emerging market characteristics so it means it's not quite the same as an emerging market because you know our debts denominated in our own currency it's a different situation to some extent but when you have these kind of structural background fiscal um to the extent that we get a recession in the next 10 years um i think it would be stagflationary more so than this big you know kind of deflationary crunch mm -hmm. or to the extent that we even get a minor deflationary crunch i think it, it, it would kind of come out of it quickly and back into a period of uh, either reflation or stagflation and you know to kind of quantify it for example what's happening in commercial real estate right now uh is that that's recessionary that is disinflationary that is deflationary You're, there's loan losses and equity losses on commercial real estate people are losing their jobs in that area that sector in isolation is disinflationary. But, you know, most estimates suggest there's something like, you know, one and a half trillion dollars in equity wiped out from commercial real estate. That's, mm -hmm. I mean, that's one year of, of current federal deficits, right? The U.S. household net worth, when you look at all households together, is something like 140 trillion. Uh, so 1.5 trillion is a little over 1% of, of just kind of damage right it's just, it's this, it's this like small problem that's kind of being rolled over in a much larger structural stimulus lynn alden provides a sobering analysis of the real estate sector in the u.s economy highlighting the potential for significant losses with an estimated 1.5 trillion dollars in equity wiped out from commercial real estate representing over one percent of u.s household net worth the repercussions are substantial while this sector experiences recessionary pressures, others, like travel companies, thrive amidst a backdrop of fiscal stimulus. Alden predicts that over the next decade, assets priced in hard money terms, such as gold or energy units, may face increased pressure compared to previous years. Um, and what happens when you get that kind of you know, fairly tight monetary policy, but fairly aggressive fiscal policy is, is the, the gap between winners and losers is bigger than normal. So commercial real estate is an outright depression, whereas travel companies are doing fairly well because mm -hmm. you know upper middle class and and wealthy people, they're generally doing fine, uh, including you know kind of older middle class and upper middle class people that have you know they've accumulated assets, they're they're getting social security, they're getting Medicare, uh, as well as just wealthy people of any kind of age, they're still getting their income and they're still spending. Um, whereas if you have any sort of like short-term debt that has to kind of roll over, like commercial real estate, for example, or um, credit card debt, those are the people that are being squeezed. Um, and so I think that that's kind of how this looks going forward is that, for example, the, the, you know, the sheer rate of unemployment in recessions might be lower than, than we've experienced in, say, the last two. Um, the rate of disinflation might be lower. Um, but that instead we feel in different ways that people say, look, I'm still I'm still employed, I'm still making an income, but for some reason it's 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 not going as far as it did last year. Mm -hmm. um, grocery price, you know, I'm getting I, I can buy fewer groceries with my weekly income. That's what people will experience. So I can buy less gasoline with my income, or traveling to visit family this Thanksgiving is prohibitive, right? Whatever whatever the pain point may be, there's more of those pain points. Um, and you know, when you look at emerging market recessions. Assets often do decently in their local currency, but they do poorly in dollars or gold terms, like basically a harder money. Mm -hmm. And if you have in the Western world kind of go through that, that basically means that in in euros or, or dollars, you know, assets could do reasonably well, maybe not great, but maybe not as bad as you think, but price in something like gold – they're probably not going to do great. I, I would argue over the next decade that, or, or when you, when you 
price them in energy units, for example. How many barrels of oil is the S&P 500 worth? Think, metrics like that I, I expect to be more pressured over the next 10 years than they have been over the prior 10 years. Continuing the discussion, Lynn Alden focuses on the intricate relationship between public and private debt. She elucidates how during recessions, private debts often shift to the public ledger through mechanisms such as fiscal stimulus and bank recapitalization. Drawing parallels to historical debt cycles, Alden underscores the challenges posed by accumulated debts and interest expenses, exacerbating the difficulty in addressing fiscal deficits. Moreover, she highlights the financialization of the US economy and its implications for tax receipts, tied closely to asset prices. And so, you know, we look at the when you look at the budget deficit, there's a couple main components. And I think it, it, it's worthwhile stepping back a little bit. It, you know, over the past 40 years, um, we have these these series of credit growth. So during an economic expansion, the private sector is taking on more debt. And during recessions, they do some degree of deleveraging, uh, especially relative to, to GDP and, and things like that. But during those deleveraging moments, there's a variety of uh, automatic stabilizers as well as, um, you know, reduction in tax receipts as well as purpose full kind of uh, one one time stimulus uh, that go in. And so what happens is a lot of that private debt that gets deleveraged instead gets transferred to the public ledger. Um, and so if you actually look at total debt, public and private, it virtually never goes down. It only went down for like like 1% during a 12 month period around the global financial crisis. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, for like 70 years straight, it's like nothing but a smooth lineup. Uh, but it just, it, it shifts around a little bit where it is. And starting with the global financial crisis in particular, but really every recession, but especially that moment, um, these accumulated private debts relative to the, a fairly small monetary base and relative to things like that, um, a lot of that debt started getting transferred to the public ledger. Not not directly. They don't just say, we're going to take that debt, but they say, look, we're going to recapitalize the banks by issuing all this stuff, and then we're going to issue bonds to pay for it. Or we're going to give out PPP loans that turn into grants, or we're going to give out corporate bailouts, or we're going to give out stimulus checks, or whatever the case may be. Um, we're going to keep raising Social Security payments despite um, the fact that our tax receipts are no longer covering them, whatever the case may be, running these deficits. Uh, and so you're, you're kind of bailing out some of the income statements of private entities and doing that by issuing more, more public bonds. And we, we generally see this over time. When Japan had their huge bubble in the late 80s, early 90s, massive debt buildup, they went through then through 30 years of private sector deleveraging. So their highly levered corporations were slowly deleveraging uh, while their public sector was leveraging up. It was kind of the slow motion transfer. Right, and we we've seen that happen before. I studied I studied the period a lot in the 1920s, 30s, and 40s to to get some analogs for today. It's kind of the last time the Western world, the, the developed Western world, went through this kind of big um, debt transfer cycle. Um, and you kind of you kind of see that play out. And so far, we're kind of seeing it play out. Just you know, with obviously there's different characteristics 80 years later in a more information based economy. But ultimately, under the surface, the same thing's kind of happening: is that private debt is rotating onto the public sector. Mm -hmm. And when you have a private debt bubble, that is disinflationary because anytime debt kind of starts being repaid back or defaulting, that's actually reducing the money supply or otherwise slowing the, the prior growth of money supply. Whereas when you have very large fiscal deficits, especially if they're monetized by the central bank or the banking system more broadly, um, that is inflationary. And then it becomes a question of relative magnitudes. So in the global financial crisis, they ran big deficits, but those were roughly equivalent to the loan losses. And so you didn't really have you kind of prevented deflation for better or worse, but you didn't really get major positive inflation. Or another way of putting it is you had you had big inflation from a negative baseline. Um, whereas what we saw uh, more recently, and this is normal with kind of late stage debt cycles, is that during the whole pandemic and lockdowns, we had massive uh, stimulus, but not really much loan destruction. Uh, and so you had a huge increase in the money supply, uh, delayed, but but substantial increase in in aggregate prices as well. Um, and what makes what what kind of makes this deficit kind of hard to deal with is that it's so accumulated, right? So if you just were running large deficits, but you had uh, an economy that was not financialized and you had a low debt to GDP ratio, then it'd be fairly easy. It'd be, it'd be hard in the sense that you'd have to cut things that are popular 
or raise taxes in an unpopular way. But it's the numbers would kind of be fairly simple if you can get past the political hurdles mm -hmm. uh, to kind of rein in the deficit. But when you have accumulated debts, uh, and a lot of that is now interest expense building up, um, that's extremely hard to deal with. And then secondly, the U.S. economy in particular, compared to say other Western economies, is more financialized, which means that a bigger percentage of our tax receipts are based on um, things like executive compensation, which is largely tied to stock issuance, uh, which means it's heavily tied to stock prices, like stock uh, performance in a given year, uh, as well as um, you know just kind of how we've structured things. Um, and so whenever we get kind of asset prices going flat to down for a year or more, generally the, the next year's tax receipts are weak. And so the deficit kind of blows out. And so overall, we build up this, this kind of huge, not only a political machine of, of structural deficits, uh, but also just the mathematically, that even if you even if you got, you know, all the most fiscal hawks in office, they would probably have trouble cutting cutting the deficit by any meaningful degree because even if you cut it you probably end up slowing down gdp and ironically blowing out the deficit further because they let it they let it metastasize to this point mm -hmm. and so normally what happens at this point is that the trains off the off the tracks nothing stops this train in the sense that really kind of running it hot and flooding it away is, is is kind of mathematically one of the few options that they have mm -hmm. and, and that's kind of where they're at right now so i would say the combination of very high public debts, um, substantial ongoing deficits, and then pretty substantial interest payments on those uh, existing debts uh, has kind of put them past the event horizon where the, the set of choices they have is now very narrow. And so we're in this, this era of just deficits as far as the eye can see are going to be trillions of dollars per year. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that what that should translate into is higher average uh, fiscal driven inflation. Um, and now what that manifests in prices depends on what the baseline is. So if we get a big productivity growth, let's say AI or something like that, or new energy source, then that could be pretty positive inflation off a very deep negative baseline. So you could get low inflation. On the other hand, if you have um, headwinds, you have things, for example, deglobalization, or AI does not take off as quickly as people think. Whatever, whatever the you know, if if tech or productivity-driven deflation is not significant, then that fiscal-driven inflation is on top of a baseline that is you know not very negative, um, and then you can get substantial price inflation. Uh, and so I think that's the era that we're in now, and that that gives us similar eras to, for example, 1940s Western world. Um, or if you look at emerging markets, it happens all the time in, in recent decades, where uh, basically fiscal deficits on an annual basis are larger than the sum of new bank loans and new corporate bond issuance. And so the credit cycles, while still important, are downplayed in their importance, and the size of the deficit is actually a key macro variable, a key investing variable, um, as well as obviously the, the political variable that it has. And that that's something we have to kind of reorient around. today. Lynn Alden provided valuable insights into the evolving economic landscape, highlighting the differences between recessions in developed and emerging markets. From the impact on asset prices to the implications for everyday consumers, we explored key factors shaping our economic trajectory. Don't forget to subscribe for more insights, like this video if you found it helpful, and share your thoughts in the comments below.